Hello, everybody. Welcome on the Lights on Data show. Have you ever wondered what it takes to break free from the corporate world and forge your own path as a successful freelance data scientist? I am George. And I'm Deanna. And today we are joined by Dimitri Visnadi, who is an independent data consultant with a focus on data strategy. He has been consulting companies leading the marketing data space, such as Unilever, Ferrero, Heineken, and Red Bull. He has lived in six countries across Europe, speaks lots of languages, and worked in both corporate and startup organizations. He was part of data departments at Hewlett Packard and a Google partner consulting firm where he was working as a data scientist. We're very excited to have you, Dimitri. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Tarsh and Diana. Oh, it's our pleasure. <laughs> and as always, we would like to start to, by asking you for a fun fact about yourself. Fun fact. <laughs> I think you already gave it away. I think always fun fact for me is when I mentioned that I've lived in six countries and That's I always amazing. try to learn about the languages. I, Even though I've mentioned I also have a small advantage because I grew up bilingual, grew up also living both in Italy and Germany. I already had two countries as a starter. Yeah, from different language families also. Mm -hmm. And working for uh, Ferrero, do you have a favorite candy? <gasps> <laughs> ah, that that's what might be also a fun fact. I <laughs> don't like candies at all. I don't, <gasps> I don't like any, and I don't like anything that is sweet. No. All oh, right. That, I think that's an advantage to you. <laughs> what? How is that even possible? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think it changed everything in puberty. And I, <laughs> because I liked sweets, I liked candies, and I didn't like vegetables until my grandpa told me, you have to eat salad. And once mm -hmm. he has a big garden, he grows his own salad, mm -hmm. his own vegetables. And suddenly I started eating his vegetables and salad and I was like, that's so good. And I couldn't go back to sweets anymore. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. Is your grandfather the Italian one or the German yes, one? Yes. The, the Italian, Italian one. Amazing. Good for you. Maybe we can connect so you can explain to me what the secret is to that. Because <laughs> well, I love her. <laughs> I feel like that was a pivotal moment in, in Dimitri's life though. Yes. And talking about pivotal moments. Dimitri, can you take us back to a pivotal moment or realization that inspired you to venture into the world of freelance data science? Mm -hmm, sure. I think there were two facts, basically, that uh, led to the decision to become a freelancer. The first one was that I, I basically, I jumped around from country to country. And often when you switch location, you always have to switch jobs as well. Because yeah. now there's a thing about working remotely. However, living abroad with still with a contract uh, tied to one country, companies don't like that. Mm. And also the fact that while I switched, I always, I look back at my, on my CV basically, and I saw that every two and a half years or every year, two and a half years, I switched companies, even though it's, I wouldn't say not common or un un uncommon in the tech industry that people often switch positions. Yeah. However, I felt it was, I was switching too much. So that mm -hmm. was one, one, one thing. And the second one was basically that in my last position, I liked the company. I liked my colleagues. However, I wasn't happy with the projects that I was uh, working on. And I always had this thing on me that I always thought because it was a, co a consulting company. I always thought that I could do it better if I had the mm. chance to decide how the, the project was had to be scoped, mm -hmm. had to be managed. And I thought always the, the way I would do it, the client would get more value out of it. Again, having this kind of conflict, especially with my supervisor at that time and not being the easiest um, employee to manage, I thought at some <laughs> point, if you complain that much at home to your wife, then you have to make a, a difference and you have to put the money where your mouth is basically and try to make it better. And uh, one way to make it better was to go independent and to be a freelancer. Right. So we do have people that are listening that they're data scientists and they're thinking of going on their own as well. What would you say that are some of those key skills and qualities uh, that they would need to cultivate to thrive in a freelance capacity? Mm -hmm. I think as a, let's call it data freelancer, I think you need three main skills. The one mm -hmm. most of us bring with it is the data skill. It doesn't matter if you're, say, a data engineer, data scientist, or a data analyst. Everyone has their own particular strength that comes to the yeah. uh, world yeah. of data. 
But there are two more pillars that I think are very important. One is communication. And I'm always a very outgoing person. I always, again, like to travel. I always love to talk to people. So generally being straightforward with people, communicating with them, doesn't mean that I was the best communicator, but I always enjoy the part of communicating with other people and mm-hmm. sharing at least what's on my mind with them. And the, sec- and the third basically pillar was the world of, let's say, business, understanding and entrepreneurship. And since a child, I always had little uh, projects on my mind to basically earn a euro or earn a buck, as they say, and uh, yeah, and to make some money on the side. And I always thought about how can I basically monetize this? And yeah, so I think having these three skills put all together, I think that's the secret sauce in order to become a data freelancer. I have to add one thing though. No one is born as a perfect, let's say, freelancer or entrepreneur or however you call mm-hmm. that, or even a perfect data scientist. There's no such thing, but is to understand where are your strengths and weaknesses and basically improve up on, uh, up on them. Said. Yeah, and I think as an entrepreneur, you really have to be on a constant growth journey. There's always new things that you can learn, new skills that you can acquire. So I think pretty intense. It's challenging. It can be exciting. But I, I think it's also something that people need to to be aware of, that you're constantly doing things. And I, I tried to be a freelancer uh, myself for a while. But then I realized that all the other skills that are required, the sales skills, the marketing skills, the, I don't know, finance aspect of it also were uh, something that I didn't enjoy as much as I thought I would. So kudos to you that you managed to bring all of those together. So that being said, how, when it comes to getting new projects, how do you find those and how do you secure freelance data yeah. science projects? So when I started out, especially when you are new to freelancing, it's always the big questions. How do I get clients? And I, when I started out, I had zero contacts basically, or I started off with zero clients. It's not like some people have this way of transitioning and having their last employer as a first client. And I think that's the, I would call it the smooth transitioning. In my case, it was like a hard cut where I said from Monday to another, I started from scratch and now I have to find uh, a client. And I basically identified four channels. The first one is, for example, freelancer platforms such as Upwork. You can already find clients on there that post specific jobs related to data. And if it matches with your skill, you have to apply it. And if, I wouldn't say if you get lucky, but if you get the job, then you found your first client. So that was one of the channels that I pursued at the very beginning. Second channel is recruiters and uh, recruiting agencies, basically, that are the middleman between the end client and the freelancer. And they basically try to position that freelancer at the one of the um, projects that the, the final company or the final client is actually looking for. So again, when I started out, I compiled a list of uh, recruiting agencies and I reached out to them. I um, sent them my CV. I uh, asked them to jump on a call, introduce myself, my skills and everything. And I want to always be fresh on their mind when there was a new data project that they were thinking about me. And eventually I also landed a project through an agency. The third one, and that's now the more challenging channel, I call it the network. And <laughs> everyone has to build their network from scratch. So that's the hard part. And for me, a network is not just having LinkedIn and have tons of connections requests because often they don't mean anything, but uh, a network, you build it over time. It's a relationship with people that you actually know, people that uh, have maybe connection through you through, because you study together, you work together, they might refer to you to someone they know that is looking for someone or even actual actually past clients that you maybe acquired through Upwork or through those recruiters. I connected to them. I became through my open way, I wouldn't say a friend, but we had a very friendly based, always conversations, talked about also stuff off platform. So that was basically a network that I started to build. And where I even nowadays get most of my clients from is basically this network where they basically refer me to friends and company, friends and colleagues that maybe move to different companies, are looking for someone in data. And uh, yeah, so that's the third channel. And the last channel, it's the Wild West, but it's called marketing. And there are so many different strategies towards it, cold outreach. Maybe some people want to do some email marketing. Some people go on podcasts. Some people go... Again, the list is endless. Build your own yeah. email list. I mentioned that already. Again, 
it's marketing. So these are the four channels. And I think the first two, as I mentioned, recruiting agencies and freelancer platforms are the easy way in. They might not be the most lucrative ones, but if you start out, you have to start somewhere. And I think always that those are the ones that I relied strongly in the first one or two years and slowly built up my network, which is now basically my secure spot for working with clients. Well, thank you so much, Dimitri, for aligning yes. these four options. I feel there's no, a yeah. lot to unpack there and it makes it easier. We also have a Susan Walsh here, the classification guru, and she's a very successful business owner and entrepreneur and a really good friend too. And she was mentioning exactly the same thing. That's exactly what I did. Lots of small jobs on freelancer websites. You don't get paid much, but you learn a lot. So, and I also think that Susan is really an inspiration. Uh, she she also commented, um, it took me ten months uh, to get my first paid uh, job, and I think it's so nice for sharing that. And I'm very grateful because it put things in perspective. And Susan is doing great. She has clients. She has a great network, but it there's a lot of work behind it. And I think. People need to be aware of that, or that there's this extra time that needs to go into that network, into building that that network. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this thing I, that I really love. It says, <clears throat> I worked my whole life for this overnight success. And I feel that the stories that reach us of freelance um, freelancers is what we hear about them when they're doing great and where things are flowing and so on. But for Every single one of them, there's a lot of work behind it. So thank you. Thank you, Susan, for sharing your stories. Yeah. Uh, do you have any any advice for uh, the data scientists who are new to managing their freelance business affairs? Because managing finances and contracts is definitely an important part of freelancing and doesn't always come easy to a lot of us. Yeah. Advice is always, I think, best given on an individual basis because right. yes. I could throw out something and then it depends on if it applies to the person or not. But regarding the financial aspect, and I think what Susan also threw in, that it took her time to get the first client. And again, as a, I think a freelancer, you are a business and every business takes on risk. And one risk is that you don't get a client or mm. you don't find a client. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I moved into freelancing, I was lucky that I saved up. I had above about eight to 12 months of saving where I knew I could cover my rent. I could cover food. I could cover some hobbies and some stuff, but I knew that if I don't get a client, I have this time to really relax, focus on and make this successful, this freelancing successful. And that's why I think it's important when you start out, before you start out, put money aside, be aware of how much you want to earn. Everyone wants to earn as much as possible, but I wonder how much you want to earn. Really have a realistic number. What's the number that basically you need to cover your bills and all the expenses on a daily basis? I knew for me that was at the beginning around 2000 euros. And I was, I knew that this is the amount I want to earn to be happy. Basically everything above that, that it be 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. Everything is possible because there's no limit. I knew that I need to get 2000 in order to be relaxed. And so having, knowing those numbers, I think that's uh, very important at the beginning of the journey. And while you go through that journey and you have good month and maybe not so good month in those good months, put money aside again, to have this puffer of always knowing in case the next two or three months, I don't get a client, I can survive for the next six, 12 months, depending yeah. on how comfortable you are. Yeah, great advice. And I would also add, if you can, to start by doing it in parallel to your full-time job, if it's something that you can start picking things up on the side as projects and building your network there, you can also do that if you're maybe more risk adverse like I am. <laughs> and what about, because technically you are a one person team, at least in the beginning and as a freelancer, and you have to do all these different things and how, how do you balance it all? How do you make sure that you're doing all these things that you wouldn't have had to worry about and at the same time making sure that you are meeting your clients expectations and you're delivering on the project that you were hired for yep good question i think there's no one way answer to it because again i think you have to experience it yourself you mm -hmm. have to go through the trouble basically you have to put in the long nights basically and work on weekends eventually even though i from the beginning 
I put a limit to myself and I said it should be a 40 hour work week, a Monday to Friday, we can sell off so I can regenerate and also again, don't neglect friends and uh, family. And yeah. uh, so that was always important for me. And uh, yeah, for the rest is you start, I think when you start out, you're in a complete, complete mess, even though you think you be, should be structured, uh, so everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. But once you survive that first, probably the first year, more or less what you can expect and you can start to structure your work and uh, you can become basically more structured, more leaner in your approach, more efficient. So it takes time. So that's why everyone who wants this quick success, there is no quick success. And as you mentioned before, why do we hear about those freelancers once they have achieved a certain success? It's because in that first year or two, they're probably too busy. They're too busy <laughs> to do other stuff. They don't have time to go on podcasts or do other stuff <laughs> because, yeah. So that's, I think that's the true fact and it takes time, but it's the beauty because I feel like, what do I enjoy about this? It's like a, I call it the mixed martial arts. You don't, mm -hmm. as an employee, you relax. Maybe you become very technical because you have more time to read blog posts and uh, learn more other data skills because that's what really um, satisfies your interests. But as a freelancer, you have so many other things to worry about. As you said before, the finances, learn how to negotiate because I want to earn more. Mm -hmm. I want to better um, sell myself to clients. Maybe. I I want to work on my marketing game. Maybe marketing is not just how I reach clients, but also how do I position myself better? Do I have to write better copies on my presentation, on my website? How, how do I become a better communicator? Do I speak too fast? Am I not pronouncing the words correctly? Do I say things because I speak to, because my clients maybe are from a different culture and I say things that maybe some of. It's also developing the self-awareness. So again, there are so many disciplines that you're, are learning, but every year or every week, every day, I learn something new and I'm so proud of that. And that's what my wife has to listen to every night when I when we sit at the table and I tell her, oh, today I did this and this. And she's let's change the topic. <laughs> Five years ago, you were complaining about your job and it uh, was all negative, but now it's too much positivity. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Love it. So we're talking about learning, right? How would you stay up to date with the latest trends and skills that you need? So concretely. Yeah. Concretely. Are there any specific websites that you go to or books or? Or courses, practices. I think, to be honest, LinkedIn is one of my inspiration of what's currently going on and what people talk yeah. to. And mm -hmm. then probably Amazon is pretty good in recommending uh, books that I like. But uh, overall to say, I try to put time aside. I put time aside and I also put a little budget aside for development. For example, mm -hmm. concrete great. speaking, I came when I started a freelancer, I basically I positioned myself as the marketing data scientist. And I focus a lot of marketing data science projects. Over the time, I learned that some of my projects were not successful. Not that the clients were not happy, but they were not successful because the clients maybe lacked quality data or any other. There was some other variable that I couldn't control. So now I pivoted over the last year. I pivoted towards being more focusing on helping clients on data strategy and planning out their projects in order to achieve successful data outcomes. And in order to acquire those skills and not just basically be in my own bubble, I took in, I, I did some online courses. I did some workshops with some other experts in the field, uh, in data strategy and so on. So again, I took the, I took some time aside. I had the budget and I do this. I try to read books, read books about negotiating, negotiation, again, all stuff that has to do with, with, let's say more the business side, because I feel like that's the one that I have to catch up a lot, as I mentioned before, the different pillars. And again, sometimes there are new data trends, but I feel if there's like a new technology out there, a new library in Python, as an example, I, again, I put time aside so I can experiment with that, test it and yeah. Thank you. Rama here, who's joining us from Indonesia, mm -hmm. he's wondering if you've ever heard a person that's working remotely as a freelancer from Asia countries, do you think that would be possible to do? Someone working remotely from Asia, I think when you work remotely, you can work from anywhere, Asia, Latin America, US, Germany, yeah. wherever it is. So I think that it is possible. 
it really comes down more or less how you sell yourself online and how you present yourself. But again, I could sit anywhere and deliver my client's projects. My clients don't need me in their office. Some of them, there are cases where some clients enjoy that you come over and to the office, mm -hmm. but also not just because they want you to, they, they want to control your work, but it's also because you start building a relationship with them. And it's one thing working with someone remotely. It's another thing if you actually meet a person and you have a completely different way of every time I, I work with a client for a significant amount of time, I also, depending on the project, I also try to travel to that client and try to see them. And I've been, again, I've uh, been abroad to some clients and see them. And every time I've met them the first time in person, our relationship changed completely and it became stronger and a complete game changer. But again, overall, my business is remote. So I could sit in Asia next to that. I forgot the name, but the person that asked the question and yeah, so Rama. I can do it, they can do it. Rama. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings also a really good question. Are there any recommendations in terms of the communication skills that you need to have then for this type of remote work? Mm -hmm. uh, is it's a bit of a different interaction that you have with the client than being in person? Yeah. Yeah. Lots of interaction, of course, goes depending on the channel you use. But I just assume if like Rama asks a question, I assume that there's someone that wants to get into data freelancing. So I always recommend maybe for beginners, again, those freelancing platforms like Upwork, and there's a lot of written communication on there. However, mm -hmm. there are some, if you are, let's say, innovative and you try to stand out, you might want to record a Loom video with some presentation of yourself or something else. So now it's not just written, but now it becomes a video. And some people feel comfortable speaking towards the, to the cameras and some not. So again, it's another skill that needs to be learned and mastered. And so these are the things that someone can improve on. And of course, one important aspect I see a lot from people, especially I've seen this now from people that say from the Indian world is also the way they communicate with each other and the way maybe the Western world communicates with each other. And if you're maybe in India and you want to get a client in Europe or in the US, we get a lot of emails or people reaching out to us saying, hello, sir, hello, ma'am, madam, and these things. And for us, they, it looks like a spam almost because we mm -hmm. often, we have this culture of directly saying, hey, George, I know you have this problem. Hey, Dimitri, hey, Diana, and so on. So if you get like an email like this, but the other day I was talking to someone and they said that even Indians, they communicate to each other very uh, politely and very respectfully yeah. and saying, telling each other, dear sir, dear ma madam. So again, be aware of those things when you communicate with someone from a different culture. That's great advice. I haven't thought about it that way, but you're right. I think I've just received so many spam emails that kind of start like that. Then now anything that starts like this as a default, my, my brain switches to that mode. Oh, I'm, mm. I might be targeted here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Colin is wondering, how do you do, how do you price jobs? And if you're working globally, how do you handle the tax situation? <laughs> it's going to yeah. be like very detailed here. That's a great question. Oh, no, very good. I'll start with the second part of the tax situation. Again, in my case, I'm a freelancer. I'm registered as a freelancing business in Spain. So again, I have my Spanish international tax ID. So whatever I do and whoever I invoice, they have my tax ID. And again, I have to pay taxes, basically income taxes in Spain. And so again, that's, mm -hmm. you, I don't care where my clients are from. There are different ways of um, dealing with it. But at least in my case, I have an accountant who does the work for me. I just have to create the invoice and bill my clients. Yeah. And so that's a simple one. How do you price? Again, there are different pricing models. The famous ones, especially in consultant, is either hourly rates, um, retainers, project-based. So, and that always depends also on the project itself. Uh, just to give a concrete example, when I start out and I work on a project and I can't really identify what's the, like the, the real size of the scope of the project, sometimes I prefer to go with hourly rate and this way I'm basically covered. Doesn't matter how long it takes. I get paid by the time and the client can also get an estimate how many hours this person takes every day, week. So they more or less see the progress 
I think it's a win for both, especially if the scope is not that clear. If the scope is very clear and I sell a very specific service to a client, I do it project based. I just tell them my project has one fee because I actually know how long does it take me to deliver it. And I'll, of course, try to increase my margins through that because I have done this project multiple times. I know how much it takes. I know what exactly the value is. So again, there might be a little bit more, more to earn on those types of projects. But again, which structure I use, it depends on the client. It depends on the project. It depends on basically my strategy. Sometimes I try out new things. Sometimes I try to sell specific services. So again, different projects, different scopes have different pricing models. Thank you. And of course, I think that's also a win-win because now the client could be getting the, the project a little bit quicker than they would have received it otherwise because you've done it before and you can be just be more efficient mm -hmm. with, with it. Yes. Yeah. Are there any memorable challenges or lessons learned or what would be called the dark night of the project or something like that that comes to mind from your freelance journey? There are. <laughs> <laughs> Because some hurt or did hurt in the past very badly. And some of them are, you work on a project, you, one of the first projects that I sold as, as a, basically a project based package. And I was very proud of that. I was like, oh, I'm going to earn on this one. I saw more of the dollar signs than the project <laughs> itself. And that was a big mistake because I, there was a kind of a change in scope throughout the project. And the main lesson here was I did not communicate the change clearly. So it was more a verbal agreement. And what happens with verbal agreements at the end, you disagree with each other and there's nothing written. Mm. And at the end, the client um, didn't want to pay me the full uh, amount of the agreed um, project. And I was very angry at that moment, but I wasn't angry with the client because I was angry at myself because it was my fault to basically ha had this happen. And therefore my lesson is communicate, communicate everything and make it written because then at the end you can't dispute it anymore and always get agreement from the client. So when I start a project, I have basically my proposal, I define everything, all the steps that need to be taken and I set it out and I ask the client to basically sign off the proposal. And then basically once we work on it and there are any changes in the work, I update my proposal with an, uh, an, an appendix basically, and basically ask the client to change it off again with the specific changes in the scope, the implications in the budget and so on. And I ask them before I do anything else. That's basically the, my main structure since I have been doing this, I have been safe, but it was a very hard lesson happened to me twice. So that's yeah. why it was <laughs> so painful that I, the third time I was like, ne never again. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry that it happened to you, but thanks for sharing the story and the tale of caution with all of us. We have a question mm -hmm. from Kate and thank you, Kate, <laughs> for the compliment. So I, if you can bring it up. So Kate is asking Kate Strachny, she's online as well. Thank you, Kate, for joining. What was, what's the best thing about freelancing? And I, I love the question because we talked a lot about challenges, the hardship. We talked about everything that you need to learn and to keep in mind. And this is a great question and a great part of it too. Mm -hmm. The best thing about freelancing <laughs> is being happy with yourself or set, very satisfied with yourself because you feel that you're growing so much more than if you were working for a company because you're just not doing, let's say, one task and you're not just relaxing because you know that you get a, a nice stable income, but it's you really have to work for your money. And again, the, of course, the benefits of being your own business is that there's no limit. If I don't work, if I'm sick, I don't earn. However, if I do pretty well and I do uh, good, then again, uh, it reflects on my bank account. And of course, it's something that's very happy. It's not only the monetary value, the monetary benefits, reward. but it's mm -hmm. basically a yeah, reward. But it's, I guess, as I mentioned before, you learn so many different things right now. Just as, as an example, I'm far away from being a... a graphic designer, but now I'm on the side, I'm doing like a, a Figma design course and learn about that. And I become so much better in designing my slides, nice. my, my, again, overall my website and all those things that I'm so proud of myself. And mm -hmm. I think that's, I'm just happy. And I think that's the best. I couldn't imagine to go back because I don't want to just do one thing and one thing only. I want to do many different things. I want to be challenged on so many levels. It can be frustrating at some points because sometimes, as you mentioned, it's a lot. 
but you overcome this and you're even proud of yourself. So I yeah. think that's the best part. Love it. And like you said, if the compass points to I'm happy, then you've had it well. And lastly, I want to ask, when do you think people should make that last jump, jump into becoming a freelancer 100% of their time? When do you think that they would be ready, they would be considered ready? Good question. When they're ready. I think there's no perfect season. moment. Mm -hmm. there, yeah. There's no perfect moment of being ready for it. There's always doubts. But I think when there's like this inner thing, either you started out and transitioning it, that, hey, there's a business here. Mm -hmm. Simple way sometimes can also be test the waters by reaching out to recruiters that can, again, get you in those contracting positions, ask them, hey, what do you think about my profile? Do you have clients that look for this? If they give you a response and say, yeah, yes, I can send you some uh, projects right away, but there's yeah. a business opportunity for you. So if you go through those online platforms, like Upwork, as I mentioned before, if you go and you see that you can d d deliver so many of those projects, there's business for you. Now it's just about making it basically succeeding as a freelancer. That's something you'll never be 100% ready for, but uh, yeah. you learn as you go. And you never stop learning. Oh, definitely. Great advice. Thank you so much, Dimitri. And I do encourage everybody to follow you on LinkedIn. Is there any other way people can come in contact with you? Mm -hmm. Again, I this summer I started the datafreelancer.com. It's basically my newsletter, how I share my advice, my experience with other fellow data freelancers or want to become freelancers giving my best, most kind of tips, lessons learned. Sometimes I share projects I work on, just they can see over my shoulder how it is and how they can become even better as they are and so on. Yeah, so the datafreelancer.com, again, my newsletter and... Thank you. I've posted in, in the comments for people to see. We'll put it in the show notes as well that people can access. And I know there's mm -hmm. a few other questions here that we didn't get a chance to. Subscribe to Dimitri's newsletter and you'll be able to get those answers. Thank you so much, Dimitri. This was so insightful. Congratulations for everything that you've built in these years, for still having a smile on your face and being enthusiastic about this work and for your contribution to, to the data world. Thank you very much for also being at our show. And thank you very much, everyone, for the questions, for your inputs, and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me.